Well, thank you for coming. My name is Wayne Shinar. I'm with the engineering office at the town of Arlington DPW. Uh, Bill Copperthorne works in my office in, as the assistant town engineer, and Emily Sullivan is our environmental planner. And uh, the reason we're doing this presentation is the new EPA permit uh, requires us to reach out to different stakeholders in the community uh, to address stop storm water and educate people on the best way to uh, approach reduction of pollutants in stormwater. So I tasked for this presentation to landscapers, landscaping professionals, and residential homeowners if they, if they are so inclined, simply because when you put fertilizer down on your lawn, depending how it's put down, when it's put on, the timing, the soil conditions, and the weather, it can do exactly what it's meant for, or it can run off into the uh, local water bottles. So part of the requirements, like I said, from the, the permit is to reach out to certain stakeholders, and this will be one of those stakeholder meetings for the year. Uh, so I'm gonna try to uh, do my best explaining uh, what I know about landscaping, or, or more lawn maintenance, and uh, by no means am I an expert. I was home up, up till midnight last night preparing this presentation, so uh, I hope it'll, it'll uh, serve its purpose. So uh, well, let me sit down if you don't mind. And uh, please feel free to uh, chime in with any questions, add any stories. Uh, the most important thing I hope to get out of this is that uh, people ask questions and learn things. Maybe learn a better way to do things or a different way to do things or you, know, you can tell us you know, how to get to more people. Uh, so here we go. The, uh, the, the reason that I chose this topic was because I didn't know there were nutrient regulations in the state of Massachusetts, um, but there are. Since the law was in effect in 2012, I think it got enacted in 2015, and basically uh, for our area we have water bodies that are impaired. Start up and my first thing is a beautiful manicured lawn. I said, how did we get here? Why are we here? Uh, it's an outreach opportunity to landscaping professionals as a requirement of our MS4 permit. And as we know, the American dream, as I already grew up, I didn't have a lawnmower with a motor on it, but I pushed one of those lawnmowers that had the real self, wasn't self-propelled, but it had a really good cut. But the American dream is, uh, it seems, all about the, the front yard, the green grass. And uh, what I picked up here is a collection of um, pictures. This is just a little picket fence, the American dream. These three have three beautiful, pristine yards. This one here as well. These, I think, are kind of interesting. I Googled sod farm. And I got down using the street view from Google, and you can just see that there's this farm, and it's just saw it as far as as far as sea I can see. And then I did a little more and I found another saw farm and I'm using the aerial image up here and you can see this is just gonna be hundred acres or so of, of grasses that uh, people are gonna be you know harvesting and putting on people's front yards. So I just thought that was quite interesting. So how did the lawns come about? This is uh, nothing to do with the uh, necessary the maintenance of a lawn but I thought found it quite interesting. In the old days, uh, the castles would be attacked by different uh, other opposing enemies, and they learned that if you cut the trees around the, the castle, they couldn't sneak up on you. And the areas were typically back right then, you know, flowers and meadows and things like that, but something that would hide any opposing armies. And back then, they came up with the word long came from the English word, so I said, heard from Google last time, it was long. To, and that just has to do with that uh, area of openness around the castle. So a lawn came from somewhere, obviously it's grass, but they called it a lawn. And it started, so they say, around the castle. And uh, as time developed, the, it wasn't necessarily all about uh, security and uh, opposing armies. It became a status symbol. They started uh, uh, manicuring the lawns, and creating these fancy, oh, fancy gardens. And I think this is Versailles right here. But what it meant was that this, it was a status symbol of, of the prestige that 
you could maintain this and how, how, how much effort and how much wealth you had in order to present such a, uh, an amazing uh, garden. Uh, but back then they didn't have lawnmowers, so they would have people out there with a scythe, which is those hand blades that they would use to cut some of the grasses. And uh, again, that was really to say, I'm the, I'm the lord of this estate and look at all the people that work for me. Uh, and this is kind of my, my ground, my domain, so it was a status symbol. And it kind of carried forward in time uh, into the 18 and 1900s where it wasn't necessarily estates or castles or things like that, but people had come across from Europe and they brought some of the lawn games with them, which were croquet and tennis and things like that. Uh, golf eventually was a, uh, another sport that developed with the advent of utilizing more grasses. And it was really, back then, for wealthy people. Um, because you can see they're out there like at the club or the tennis match, dressed up into a big, big ordeal. And uh, it was, back then, only the wealthy had the, the grass and the lawns. And then in the 1940s, um, Abraham Levitt was a great big developer and developed over 17,000 homes. But one of the big things he used to sell is he would build the host houses and he would install the sod and the lawn and the grass and have it manicured and complete before he would sell the houses. So it was like walking into a, an already established home. It wasn't brand new with a patch of uh, dirt in front of it. And it was incredibly popular. It coincided with the end of World War II. Uh, and as you see, it turned into suburban sprawl. And this is what transferred, transgressed all across the country. We're a suburban uh, country now. And uh, this is just a very large sprawl, but this is a little zoomed in up close and shows you how much grass is involved. And um, it how we as a country and a society appreciate it. So it's the middle class pursuit. You have some Norman Rockwell pictures, you've got the Thai guy spending the time on the weekend out his lawn. It's a big deal. It's a, there's a lot of effort that goes into uh, maintaining our yards. Uh, but I think we've got too far. I think maybe it's an obsession. You know, is, it, is this what we're going for? Is it an obsession? And uh, I mean, we've got some. You've seen the, the fields at the you know Red Sox where they can cut in the pictures of the of the of the logos. Um, I, I thought this was it was kind of kind of funny. We're not out there with toxins mowing our grass, obviously, but haven't gone too far. You know what I mean? And I think what you'll notice is uh, a lot of people don't do it anymore. It's become a big business. It's a lot of work. So people are just tired of I think a lot of people of taking care of their lawns. Uh, so maybe we're going back. It's not necessarily that status symbol of prestige anymore. So these are some interesting facts that I, that I learned during my research. 80% of the houses in the country have lawn. More water, to, grass is a bigger crop than the wheat and the corn that we grow across the whole country. We, spend, we, we irrigate more water on our lawns than we do developing the grains of corn and wheat for food production. And a third, they, they guess 30, a third of our public water goes to watering the grass. And they did say 70% in arid regions, maybe like Las Vegas or Arizona, 70% of the water, depending on the season, can be applied to, to grass or to the landscaping and lawns, which is amazing. Um, and we spend three billion hours mowing the grass uh, to take care of our houses. Like I said, the big industry, the $40 billion industry, the lawn maintenance, yard care, pesticide applications, horticulture, arboriculture, all this other kind of stuff that's involved with our yards. So I think, as you saw, the other things, people get frustrated and probably it's too much effort to take care of the yards, so it's time to hire a professional. If we're going to hire a professional, um, we hope that it's, it's it's going to be someone who can understand uh, how the grass is functioning, how you're going to take care of it, and hopefully how we can protect the environment at the same time. And that's what I'll get into now. So uh, it's a lot more than just mowing the lawn. So there's a lot more going on, and I hope to get into that a little bit here. Uh, before we go further, any questions? 
interesting facts, tidbits. All right. Uh, so, like I said earlier, I'm a layman. I'm not. I don't know much about grass. So, what you see here is what I've learned from uh, the internet and articles in the last week or so. Uh, and I find it interesting that you know we see a, a lawn that looks like a carpet, but uh, someone who gets into the vegetation and the, the biology of it, there's a whole lot more involved with a piece of grass. Um, and I think my bigger interest in lawns is the soil because I have a, an interest in the soils that are underneath it. And you'll see over here that it, with a, a, a good soil, you'll have deep root growth, which gives you a great uh, grass product up top. And when it's not so good soil, then your roots are stunted and your plants are stunted as well. So um, I'm not going to read these things. I'm kind of just going to go through it. If you have any questions or want to add anything to this, feel free. Um, but basically, I'm imagining there are a gazillion of these in every lawn. And um, yeah, we'll move along. So what does grass need? Um, it needs sunlight, it needs air, it needs water, and soil. That's, those are the four things that are going to uh, allow the plant to thrive. Um, the sunlight is more of the, the black box. I don't know if you learn about photosynthesis in school, but basically it uses the, the sun's energy and carbon dioxide and some chemical and uh, biological activity to turn the sunlight energy to grow the plant. Uh, the energy is used to transfer and to take nutrients from the soil, turn it into carbohydrates, turn it into food for the plant, and, and use it and spread it out into the stalk, the stem, and the root, so that it's uh, a functioning plant. Um, the air, obviously, they, they use CO2 and they discharge uh, oxygen. Uh, again, that can be taken in through the, the petals, or the petals, the leaf of the grass itself as well as the roots. Um, obviously, the water concept is that they're thirsty, um, but a lot of the nutrients are going to be coming in through that water, and obviously they plant it in the soil. The soil is where all the nutrients are, and the water is just inside of it, uh, going through the pores and things like that. So I'm going to just do a quick little slide on each of those four topics, and. Uh, See if there's any questions if you guys have any input as well. Um, I think I've been on this. It transforms the light and carbon dioxide and the minerals to create the food for itself. So, um, yeah, I already, already said this. So, we're going to move along from the sunlight, go up to the air, uh, take some carbon dioxide and water, emits oxygen, and the plant grows. Uh, interesting trivia fact I found was. A acre of grass can produce enough oxygen for 64 people for a day. So I, that's pretty neat. So you're talking about the rainforest, or you know, rainforest probably does thousand people, but there is some benefit, obviously, to it. Um, but I thought of that. the tree, you know, helping with oxygen, but not grass, and it does. <coughs> the water in the soil dissolves the minerals. Uh, that are in the soil that the plant can use. Um, important thing is the balance of air and water in the soil. There are soil pores in there that are, um, that are generated by the characteristics of the soil, the amount of clay, the amount of organic matter, the amount of sand and silt uh, has an impact on the type of uh, soil. Uh, too much soil or too much air in the soil and uh, you don't have enough water to get thirsty, too much water to dump up air, and then it'll suffocate. So there's a, a balance in the soil um, for water and air that we need to, to meet. The soil um, does many things. It anchors the roots, keeps them uh, sturdy, supplies the water to the roots, provides the air to the roots, furnishes the nutrients. And uh, as it interacts with the water and the roots, it releases uh, nutrients to them. Okay. I think more we've already touched on this. Uh, the plant will be more effective if the soil characteristics are right. Uh, you have a loose soil, the roots can spread out. You've heard uh, compacted soil. 
tight soil, the roots can't push themselves out into it to get into the other parts of the soil to absorb more nutrients. So, so the loose area in the soil is a good thing. Uh, and then the amount of clay that might be in it or different organic matter, depending how absorbent it is, depending on how much water it has, depending on how that uh, will uh, allow the plant to absorb water. Um, the soil needs to be rich enough to provide the plant with nutrients, which is where I think uh, we as, or you as lawn care professionals will come in. Will you be feeding the, the soil with amendments to, to make sure that the grass has the appropriate amount of nutrients? And uh, as I said previously, the compacted soil doesn't have enough air and it stunts to grow. So. Basically, soil has two components. It's made of um, solid particles and made of pore space. The solid particles is basically uh, broken down into sand, silt, and clay, uh, about, say, 95%. And then the organic matter is, uh, is anywhere from 2 to 5%. And that can come from the debris, the roots within the plant, uh, any, any carbon or, or animals that may or uh, decay within the soil, leaves in the forest and things like that, and put organic matter in. And a lawn is going to be more of the, the lawn clippings. If you, if you collect them, then there'll be less there. Uh, show our hands here. Uh, when you guys um, get into the lawn maintenance part of it, do you, uh, do you bag the clippings or do you let it go back onto the grass? Depends on the season, you know, how long one I do. What, 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 why is that? If it's crabgrass, I don't want to spread it. <laughs> if it's naturals, dry, okay. or Kentucky bluegrass, I don't mind spreading it because it'll regenerate. Oh, okay. You I don't want to regenerate crabgrass. <laughs> so now you get a little more herbicide yeah. down right. in the fall to contaminate the land. Okay. How about you? Same as last year. I've never even thought of the grab, I was just thinking of we don't want to spread it. Huh, that's interesting. Spread as we Yeah. I don't know what you're talking about. Now, the interesting part is the other, the other void, the pores, the pores, the void space in the, uh, in the soil, I think it's just as critical as the soil itself. It gives the ability for the roots to move, the water to migrate, the water pulls the nutrients that dissolve out of the soil. And, uh, and, and it's really a balance of everything working together to get a perfect yard. And I bet you there's probably not many out there that are. But uh, that's why I've been fighting my lawn for 25 years and I still don't have it there. Someday maybe I'll hire somebody. Hmm. Uh, well, uh, so, sorry if I met. Yeah? I had to, I couldn't get grass to grow. I couldn't do it. I was religious about it as a home. Got a triple bag, I started bagging up, it still wasn't working. It wasn't until I started uh, putting the air holes into it in September, aerating, aerating the soil, mm -hmm. because my soil had for so many years from the previous owner been compacted, mm -hmm. and nothing was getting through. The water was running off and everything. Ever since I do that every September, yeah. now I get grass. I still get crabgrass, which they treat. We're going to learn what else that aerating is doing besides uncompacting. Pretty good picture for that. I learned that as well this week. Uh, so within the soil, you, you have different nutrients. I don't want to get into it. The, the big three are the macronutrients uh, that are in, in uh, fertilizers. And it's the NPK logo, the nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. So those are the three I'm going to focus on. But uh, these are all the different nutrients of, that are in soil or that the lawn, the grass needs. And it's a quite complex interaction of how the plant gets those nutrients um, through the air, through the ground, time release, it's to, you know, synthetic versus organic. It's, uh, it's, it's, just, it's just so complicated. I just wanted to show the picture of everything that can go on. And, uh, but it needs the nutrients. And uh, the big three, you got nitrogen, phosphorus, and um, potassium. I tried to just kind of give a brief synopsis of what it said that nitrogen does and what it benefits our time. Really, just going to read this now, but uh, it gets the nitrogen gets absorbed through the plant roots. Um, basically, the important thing is putting it the right amount down and at the right time. So it depends on the season and the stage of the grass growth when you should put it down because it's going to use 
the net, I believe, is to, to make the shoots grow and the roots spread out. So that's something I believe is your applications in the beginning of the springtime, is that it? So the, uh, the timing is very important and the amount we get to, if you put too much down, that could just wash off in the, in the lake. Uh, so if any nitrogen stimulates the shoot growth, it helps the, the whole um, photosynthesis process that, that, that generates the energy and their generates the chlorophyll that makes the grass look more green. Uh, and obviously it helps it reproduce. And I think if the plant is growing well and the soil is right, besides growing tall and having to mow it, the roots are spreading out as well and then giving you more coverage. It takes away the open space available for weeds and lets the, the, the grass grow uh, uh, more lush. Phosphorus, uh, I say it, it, it's, when it's required, it's required in large quantities. I don't necessarily understand what that says, but it's not always available. It's in, a, it's in the minerals, and the roots can't take the, the soil, the, the nutrients straight out of the mineral. So what it uses is it uses um, bacteria and microbial activity of the root on the minerals. It uses uh, water against the minerals and the chemical dissolving and uh, stuff that, that, that actually takes the nutrients out of the sand particle, the clay particle, the silt particle. Um, so that phosphorus is needed to help the seed germination, make the lawn lush, and establish root growth. But it's just not always available in, in the lawn, in the soil, so that's when we put it down with, uh, with the fertilizer application or soil amendment. And potassium. Photosynthesis, uh, and also photosynthesis and uh, better water absorption and respiration of the plant. Um, it seems like they all were working on root development, but each one has some other benefits. It helps with the disease and drought resistance and structure of the walls and the, the health of the plant itself. So nutrient uptake, the nutrients in the, in the organic matter, and it's in the, uh, the mineral content of the soil. So that's where we have to take that, the plant has to take those nutrients out of the minerals and does it through, like I just claimed previously, I jumped ahead, sorry, uh, chemically, bacteria, microbial-wise, and then just dissolving as the water uh, flows through the soil or sits in the soil, uh, chemical, Besides dissolving out of it, the chemical action within the water and the, the I don't want to say the ingredients, but the, the, the material themselves of the mineral somehow transform and let the, the, the nutrients come out of the particle, the mineral particles in these root. So if there's not enough nutrients for the lawn, then we use fertilizers to supplement the, the nutrients in the soil. Um, as you see, I put asterisks on both of these, uh, but you have to be careful not to put too much. Uh, so this is really the focus of this. We're going to talk about the application of fertilizers and what happens if there's too much and how it uh, flows off the land into the water bodies. Finally, we're at stormwater. So everybody know what stormwater is? Stormwater, ground by rain hits the ground, flows downhill. Um, Make matters made worse when it hits a roof or a lawn or a road. Typically, with development, all these things get put out there and it doesn't get into the ground and it runs off into the river and flows into Boston Harbor. So, it doesn't benefit us when we have an uh, impervious area because it just rushes off quickly. But on those areas that is not impervious, like lawns, or farms or fields, anything that's on that, that land can roll off if it's not bound to the soil. So what we, we like in the soil for lawns is we like something bound into the minerals of the soil that, that the grass root through photosynthesis and all those little activities that are going down in the soil with the, the roots, they're taking it out of the soil rather than just sitting there in that fertilizer particle that may just wash away when the next rainstorm so there are different approaches to that. We'll talk about that later. It has to do with the long, uh, slow release and fast release of what we're putting down to help this, the grass. 
And when these contaminants, these phosphoruses and nitrogens roll off and get into our water bodies, it creates these bacteria uh, and al uh, algae within the water bodies. And when those algae die, they go to a chemical decomposition, a microbial decomposition, and that's when the water starts getting cloudy and discolored, and it's using up all the oxygen. So it affects fish, it affects um, you know, just the plant, the normal everyday plant life, like the lily pad or vegetation along the edges of the, the uh, lake. It affects them all. And if you heard, and anybody heard about the toxic cyanobacteria in the news lately? You've heard about it, and it's on Arlington, it's everywhere. And, and that's what that is. Uh, I believe that's a mystic bird, right? 2017. But as I was researching this, I found a an article talking about uh, toxic algae from 2009. And here is 2019, and I got two just in the month of June in the Arlington patch. So it's been going on for a long time, and which means we're still getting pollutants into the, the water bodies. Um, back on phosphorus and nitrogen. I think this was supposed to be at a different page in the slide, but I will say uh, NPK, you guys are all aware that the, the numbering system is, uh, is the um, percent of the nitrogen, nitrogen phosphorus, and calcium, and potassium within uh, a bag of fertilizer. sit there in a pile like I do, I don't always clean them up quickly. Those break down and they, they are organic and they just decay and create phosphorus as well. So a decaying leaves pile or, or, or grass clippings can discharge phosphorus that can also run off. Be it organic and natural, it's still a, a potential contaminant source. Um, so what we say here is if you are best way to approach that is if you're making your application, you don't want to put, it, put your applications on the grass. So what, can you tell me what procedures you follow when you're, when you're beginning to apply fertilizer? Do you put it on a tarp, on the driveway, on the grass? How do you do that? When, you, when you're taking the bags off the truck, you've got to go put it onto the... the uh, I do it off the street. So you do it in the street. Yeah. <laughs> you know, what happens when you split it? Right, if you jump, dump a bunch of the lawn, it's going to burn the lawn. Right. So you do it on the street and you have the spreader and then you set the spreader. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to ask you next time to put a tarp on there or make sure you sweep it up after A, it costs money, so yeah. you, you want to save it. B, it, uh, it's now even closer to the catch basin, so if there's any there it rains, it rushes it rains. <laughs> you ever see uh, painters uh, painting a house and then washing their brushes out in the street? Kind of the same thing. Oh, this yeah. Paint is visible, the phosphorus is not. So, what can you do as a landscape professional? Uh, obviously, you're here to help the homeowners give them that lush green lawn and, and do all the work that they don't want to. So, you've got to be maintaining their yards for them. Uh, you throw different types of uh, spreaders up there broadcast spreader and a drop spreader. Um, one of the things that is, is, is helps the soil interact better with the plants is pH. Uh, the pH of the soil is a measure of the acidity or alkalinity um, of the soil. And lawns, they say, ideally between 6.2 and 7 is the pH that you're looking for. So if you can do that, you're going to have a better microbial and chem chemical uh, interaction for the plants to get the nutrients. If you're if you're lower or higher, then that plant isn't going to be able to be as efficient at getting the nutrients out of it, and it will then be stunted or die or, or something. It's just not going to be as efficient or as lush as it could be if it was given the best characteristics to grow in. Uh, I think I just mentioned that your goal is to be between 6.8 8 and 7.2, the other slide said 6.2, let me go back to a second, 
Assessment and, uh, and 
evaluate it and look at it, or do you kind of deal with it when that crew goes out there at that time of year? Yeah. It's, so it's really kind of an on-site assessment, not not when you get take the leaves yeah. off and just see what's yeah. underneath. Okay. All right. Feedback from crews, like you know, depending on week to week, like what needs to be repaired, and you can get that pretty early on in the season. I'm telling you right now, if I'm coming to you, you mentioned me, I'm a morning trying to do this yourself. I, 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 I had some bare spots and I planted some seed, but at the same time, the crab was destroyed. And I know I'm going to plant seed until I, when I went out there watering it in the morning and the evening. And I felt all oh, the dry seed. And I just planted it. And I'm like, yeah, well, I'm thinking it might come back, but I didn't. So I planted more seed and I just did that properly. That's a never ending process. Always hire professionals, I guess. So. Recommendation is having a pesticide license myself. Uh, there are so many regulations now that in my particular application, my man knows not to put anything but slow release down because it takes its time and it keeps it away from the border on my property. It's not 100 yards away. It's wetlands and conservation. Oh, here there's no regulations. We'll get to those. You know, You'll see them. The difference between slow release and he never uses uh, quick release on my own just because of my environment. Mm -hmm. Well, that's something you need to pay attention to. And we'll get into that a little bit later. But, but that's it. I, I appreciate that you brought that up because I'm, I'm the town's conservation agent too. And I know the conservation commission is like when we condition permits, when you know we get a, a new permit, a new house, or someone who wants to just build a, a porch in the backyard. We have started conditioning properties so that they can only use slow release fertilizer and limit the number of uses in the year. So, mm -hmm. um, so it, it's nice to, to hear that as a homeowner, you're actually aware of that. Yeah, so but that's yeah. only because I got the license. On yeah. Educate, but I, I'm lucky enough to educate my neighbors too about it too. Good. Okay. All right. Well, we're gonna get to that. That's really the point on this was these new regulations that I mentioned at the beginning. We're kind of gonna wrap that up and, and settle. Um, not seeing, not seeing the uh, transfer here, but it's going back into the runoff parts here. And I think as we're leaving the, the application of the fertilizers, if you have that quick release, it can run off faster and cause nutrient problems. And you'll see, like I said, they've uh, they closed the beaches and the ponds for swimming and for pets and things like that. Uh, but we, as a town, we're committed and but we're required to, to improve our water quality conditions in the water bodies in town. So what we're doing is, A, we're trying to educate people on things uh, for residents and professionals so that as you go down, if you can, uh, say you make 30 applications a year and you do them in the street, there's 30 little bits of fertilizer and you just maybe a half a cup that walk down the, the um, uh, storm drain. Well, next year, you got to be more careful. There's 30 less that's going to happen. And if we can do 30 less over here, and the homeowners and all that will do it on there, just put a six by six tarp on there. It's easy to do. Pour your fertilizer in. If anything spills over, it's on the top. You wrap it up. You put it back in the in the spreader. Uh, another thing I'll say is when you're applying it, obviously it doesn't doesn't do you any good to, to overlap it onto the sidewalk or the or the uh, driveway. So you either do the blower or blow it back onto the grass so you get the benefit of it. Otherwise, it's just going to end up in the storm drain. So. We, the way we use the fertilizer and how we clean up uh, can make a big difference. So, uh, in town, we put in some rain gardens, and this is going to be more out of the lawn maintenance and into the landscaping portion of it. But this is a rain garden over at the Hardy School. You don't see it, but it's a slight depression in there that takes all the water from the parking lot of the Harley Hardy School on a low storm, and, uh, and all of it goes in there. Migrates water migrates slowly through the soils and the plants uptake a lot of the water instead of running right into the, the storm drain It's being filtered through the, the soil and the plants prior to that There's a, another one here over at the intersection of Edgerton and Herbert This one has a little more flowers and a little more Aesthetically appealing and then one of the other things we did this year is nothing to do with landscaping But we're trying to to uh, what we did we cut some trenches into the street and we put small infiltration trenches connected to catch basins. So when the water comes in, we're diverting it. Before it gets to the pipe that goes to the river, we put it on a smaller, uh, a 
the smaller the slower pipe that takes the beginning of the water and puts it into the ground to infiltrate slowly rather than rushing straight out into the river. So now it's going to recharge the aquifer and uh, it'll help the health of the river a little bit. So we're, we're trying to do things where we should require to, and this is the first approaches that we took to try. Now the new treatment regulations, as I said earlier, came out in 2015 and um, it had a lot to do with how you use the fertilizer. It's all meant to, 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 to reduce stormwater pollution. So uh, these are going to be some of the requirements that the regulations require you to do and uh, I will get it in. So the regulations say, obviously, I think it's really spelled self-explanatory, but December, January, February, I think professionals know not to apply anything. Homeowners might not. You might think, oh, the, the grass is, is clear, it's June, and it's January 10th, it's 40 degrees out. You know what? I forgot to put fertilizer down in the fall. I'm going to get it down now so it's there for the springtime. Well, that's a no-no because the soil's frozen, it's going to run off, it's just Bad day, bad timing. So uh, you shouldn't be putting it down in frozen soil. If it's going to rain within 24 hours, you shouldn't fertilize it either because it'll wash away. So the timing is important. Um, then the location. Here's your, uh, this is where the overlap of the spray from the spreader got out in the driveway. Uh, clean that up so it doesn't wash down the, uh, down the storm drain. Uh, but clean it up if you can because it's not helping the grass on the on the pavement. Uh, this is, has to do with those regulations you were talking about. The the nutrient regulations say that if you're using a targeted application, which I'm going to assume is the drop spreader, or possibly maybe a liquid after something targeted where you have more control over it, you can go up to 10 feet to a wetland according to the state regulations. Conservation Commission, if you did something there, might have additional conditions. This is just what's in the regulations. And if you're using a broadcast spreader that swirls it up in that spiral approach, then they, they stay 20 feet away from wetlands, water, bodies, streams, brooks, lakes, things like that. Oh. The clickability of this regulations, um, I think, is far from reaching. Uh, it, it, it's applied everywhere. Phosphorus goes down on every lawn, and what this new regulation says is that you should not be putting down phosphorus until you do a soil test. And the soil test will tell you whether you have enough phosphorus, whether you have enough nitrogen, and it'll make a recommendation on what the right um, fertilizer or components of fertilizer that you need to put down. Um, just because it's a state university, um, the UMass Extension offers uh, soil testing uh, to, to do soil. And you're supposed to have a soil test before you apply fertilizer so you are educated as to what you're trying to give the soil. The interesting thing about the soil test is you just don't go on one spot things are random. So they recommend taking a little core or gore in 12 random locations. And it's just, that's what they say, 12. I don't know if you should do 6 or 17, but they, if you have a 6,000 square foot yard or a 75,000 square foot state, I guess you want to make sure you're in the same area. If this is all in the general same area and the conditions look the same, then just spread out the 12 random locations, whether it's in a small lot or this testing is, is, is really to just apply what's needed as opposed to just randomly putting down you know something that you may buy off the shelf. Um, I will say that if you look going to uh, hardware stores or Home Depots, they are supposed to keep their, their phosphorus and zero phosphorus fertilizers separate. Um, I particularly noticed at Home Depot that they're right next to each other. Other places have had them across the aisle from each other. But there's also a, a notice that they should be posting that says that it's you know zero zero phosphorus is is necessary and um, the, the phosphorus that's included should only be used at uh, certain times in certain locations. So 
So let's describe the soil test a little bit. Um, take your 12 samples. Uh, it's a little broad. I'm actually going to get one because I'm going to test my soil for the first time. You can go down about four to six inches. And then uh, I watched a video on this. So you basically put them all into a, a, a bucket. Put the 12 in and then you take out any roots, any, any stones, and any, any leaves and stir it all up. Mix it all up so you get a, a mixed representation of all those samples. And then measure out one cup, put it in a bag, use the application, put it in a, uh, uh, an envelope and you mail it off to, to UMass or if you have a, a, a place nearby that can do it. I don't know what places provide the soil analysis. Mahoney's does. Hmm? Mahoney's does. Great. Um, that's good because you, you could probably do all the soil samples for your customers in a certain week and bring them there and not have to mail them out to UMass or other, some other uh, extension program. Um, so that's something that's good to do in the fall so you know what you're going to apply in the springtime. Uh, this is just a, a, a result, a, a, a sample result of the uh, soil analysis and it tells you the, uh, all the macro and micronutrients in there. Um, pretty much on the bottom is a bar chart. It tells you where you stand. If you were to look on this one here, you say I would say you do not eat the crossers because you're above optimum, and the regulations actually say uh, what that level is. Uh, potassium, now you want to maybe use a nitrogen potassium uh, fertilizer with zero crossers because you're low on potassium. Um, but I don't see nitrogen up there. I see nitrogen. Oh, that also gives you pH, but a good value is 6.9 right in the middle. It's a little closer. Zoom in here. Uh, optimum range. So it tells you the range, 4 to 14. You're at 26.4. Don't put down phosphorus. Not like that. You're paying more for a bag of hot fertilizer that has phosphorus in it, and it's just, it's not going to do anything because it, it, uh, the plant can only take up as much of phosphorus as it needs. You can't take more. So what I would recommend is uh, to check out the uh, UMass uh, Extension Program uh, Turf Management Guidelines. There's a lot of good information on there. Um, it tells you it's just like 27 pages or something like that. But it's really, if you find things like this interesting, uh, lots of good information. Now, as a professional, you do not need a license. Uh, unless you can correct me, I don't believe you need a license to apply fertilizer but you are required to take records. Um, there are no soil police, there's no fertilizer police. I'll be honest with you, the uh, nutrient regulations are, are governed or uh, under the jurisdiction of the Department of Agricultural Resources. And let me tell you, I, I've called them five or six times to try to get someone to give a presentation such as this, and I could not get anybody to do it, so that's why I'm doing it today. <laughs> So I guess I'm done tongue in cheek a little bit saying there's no fertilizer police uh, that are going to find you if this happens, but they could. If they come in and want to come out there or if they get more staff, they could do that. Uh, if you want to promote yourself as an environmentally friendly uh, service, you can promote that to your residents and you probably get some people that, that, that wouldn't be aware of it and they might use you for that. And then you can say, follow the nutrient regulations, you keep track of where you're using it, the amount you put down on the lot, what the soil analysis says, and when you apply it. That's what the uh, applicators are supposed to be doing according to the regulations. And if you don't, then we'll do this. No, I'm kidding. If you don't. <laughs> I don't know what would happen, but, um, you know, do it later. <laughs> Uh, this is a little bit talking about what I said at the, at the hardware stores. Um, after you get your soil test and it says you have optimum or you have enough phosphorus, then you want to be looking for a bag that has zero in the middle, the NPK, where the P is zero. Um, this is going to be my guess for the future. Um, nitrogen is an issue as well, but I think nitrogen is used up more quickly than phosphorus. So I don't know if there's going to be any way, if you have enough uh, nitrogen and you have enough phosphorus, but you need potassium, that's a, a, 
I think more an advanced class on uh, nutrients that I'm unable to, to figure out. But maybe it's not that complicated. And that's it. If you don't have questions, um, I have lots of questions for you guys. Just, just how you work and, and, and um, uh, how you approach it, and, and what you do, and what you think you we should do to reach out to more landscape person next time. Uh, we are videotaping this one, so what I will do is when it's available, I will send that link to everybody that we sent the email out to, uh, and we'll be able to tell the EPA that we, you know, we we targeted you know, 50. Uh, landscaping professionals with a video and a presentation. Uh, so I guess my biggest question is A, um, if you pay attention to the phosphorus um, and fertilize your applications, that's going to benefit our water bodies. So uh, with that, I'll say thank you and we'll uh, cut the video and